ways you'll catch a sense of that this morning. But thank you so much to AD and the worship team. Uh, it's so encouraging. Great to see, you know, that there's a, a range of uh, ages there, including some of the young folk. I think that really encouraged our own kids when they were encouraged to uh, help uh, with that in, in the church we were in at the time. So that's really good. It was great to be here, uh, was it a week ago Thursday, uh, for the report by Costell and Mark. I was really encouraging and whetted my appetite for going back to Moldova. So just as Paul, of course, will value your prayers at the end of November, start to accept when he goes, and uh, Bob too, and whoever else might be going. So the same truth for myself. A young guy who was with me on Thursday, he was exploring the possibility of going, Ben Carpenter, plan is he's coming out with me uh, as a sort of apprentice and then Gordon Curley's going and he's taking a guy called Jamie Brody who's uh, in the Tulsa County's Associate Evangelist, I, I can't remember but I ought to know, but I don't. Um, so yeah, we value your prayers. We also value your prayers on contacting schools about trying to take an old food Bible in. I'm virtually as good as into one new school uh, near us. And there's another one I contacted. I really thought that would be the one I'd get into easiest uh, because I'm into four other schools and their multi academy trust. But I haven't even got a response yet. So just pray as I try and phone them up tomorrow or Tuesday and see if I can get a response. Uh, that school is called Fairhaven. Nice name, isn't it? Fairhaven Primary School. But uh, yeah, we're uh, looking at John chapter 21. As you know, verses 1 to 17. And uh, just to remind you, and uh, is the PowerPoint up? Oh, I've switched that on. That's where it's not responding. There we go. Uh, it's amazing yeah, what the life button will do. Uh, yeah, and there you go, reminder. John, uh, the, the book is about presenting Jesus as God the Son or the Son of God. And we're going to see his power in what happens in this account in John chapter 21 as the Son of God, God the Son, acts to help out his disciples. So John 21, verses 1 to 17, 1 to 17, that's right. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. This is after his resurrection. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you've just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. So that's God's word. And that is really amazingly powerful. So breakfast with Jesus is what we're looking at this morning. But the question I want to ask you is, are you invited? Talking of invitations, the picture of that church is up for a reason. That's a Catholic church in Slough, uh, that beautiful town which perhaps could be called Slough to Spond. But uh, the, the reason I've got that church up is because uh, of a particular woman who seemed to be part of that church. And she had been attending funerals, apparently, for oh, about 15 years. Funerals even of people she didn't know. But it seems her motive was to get a free lunch. And the lady in question, who was known to grieve, who was, uh, even chats to grieving family members, uh, was known to Father Noah Connolly, who was the uh, priest in charge of the church at the time, the Holy Redeemer in Slough. And uh, she had said that she felt it was her duty to attend as many church masses as possible. But he said, well, I can't really turn her away. He said, every funeral we have, she comes, and if there's a reception afterwards, she makes her way to it without invitation. Uh, she's a Catholic woman, and she's convinced she needs to go to as many masses as possible. And that's a they course, they have masses at the funerals. Uh, but she was confronted and awake uh, by, uh, one, one, uh, one way, by a family member of the deceased. Uh, but she just turned up on a bike, began chatting to guests, and she even got one of the grieving family to give her a lift uh, from the church to the Irish Centre for the wake. Um, and people assumed she was a work colleague. And when asked if she knew the deceased, how she knew the deceased family member, she said, oh, I knew through working with her as a waitress. Uh, the only problem with it was that her family knew she never worked as a waitress. And they said, is one family member, she was eating from the buffet like there was no tomorrow. So, yeah, she gate crashed uh, many a funeral wake for a good feed. But the thing is that Jesus here is doing a breakfast, a breakfast, and he's inviting the disciples to join him. He says, come and have breakfast in verse 12. But, you know, he's inviting you and I, not to a wedding breakfast, but a wedding supper. Now, don't ask me why we have this ridiculous title for the meals at weddings at the reception called the wedding breakfast. Because if you think that's your breakfast, you are going to be very hungry by the time it gets to 3 p.m. You might just about be sitting down to eat, uh, but for some reason we do. But in the Bible, it talks about the wedding supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, who is Jesus. And the great thing is that you and I are invited to be there in heaven, enjoying that tremendous celebration with Jesus. And the invitation is open to any and everyone, just as those disciples were invited to that particular event. We are all invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Jesus is always full of invitations. Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am uh, meek and lowly in heart, and will find rest for your souls. So he invites us to do just that, to join him for that. In fact, in Revelation chapter 22, not long after we read about this wedding supper of the Lamb, it says in verse 17 that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Bride, that is actually the church, they come, let him who hears say come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. To be thirsty, to know real, never failing, never let you down love. Jesus offers that. Are you thirsting to know real, true, ultimate meaning and purpose in your life. Jesus offers you that. If you're thirsting to know forgiveness, he offers you that because of his blood shed on the cross. Whatever you are thirsting for, the deepest level of your soul, that can be satisfied in him and in him alone. 
And so the invitation in every thirsty, let him come, let her come. Because Jesus is offering his kingdom to everyone. But you have to come by the cross. You have to repent of your sin and put your faith in his finished work at the cross and determine to follow him as you know that all are invited. In fact, in Revelation 3 20, turn its head slightly because there, in Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, let him open the door and I will come in. So if you're going to be uh, receiving that wedding invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb, to a glorious eternity in heaven, then you've got to first invite him into your heart and life and all have that available. But you invite, they're invited to this breakfast. Well, they didn't have anything until Jesus intervened, but they did bring some fish. But what will you bring to the party, so to speak? It's a, a bring and share this. Um, that, that Jesus was having his bring and share barbecue. What will you bring? What fish will you bring? But interestingly, there's a very similar incident to this early on in the ministry of Jesus. It's recorded in Luke chapter 5. Very similar. They've been fishing all night again, the disciples. Again, they've caught nothing. And Jesus turns up and he tells them to put it this time to put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch, a catch, and they have this overwhelming catch of fish. But then Jesus says to Simon, and by implication to the other disciples who were there, who certainly included his brother James and their fishing partners, uh, sorry, his brother Andrew and their fishing partners, James and John, he says, don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So the idea was they would catch men in the sense of bringing them to Jesus to know his forgiveness and his love and his salvation. And in the same way, that's what we're expected to do, to fish the people, to bring people to Jesus. And the Great Commission says it in Matthew 28, where Jesus says, go into all the world, doesn't he? I believe this is passed on down the ages from his disciples. Um, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So we all have a part to play in the Great Commission. And you might be thinking, well, I just include me. Even if you're a Christian, I just include me. Because I've really let the Lord down bad. I'm not going to be much use to him. Why would he want to use me anyway? No, no, not for me. Or maybe you're thinking, I'm just so full of doubts and uncertainty. How can I share the gospel with anyone when I'm full of doubt myself? And I sometimes wonder if I'm really saved. And, no, no, I, I'm not going to be any use in that particular uh, area. Or maybe you think, yeah, but I've got some sin I struggle with in my life. That rules me out. Uh, yeah, maybe I've got a huge amount of well, I've got a really fast and thumped, a really bad temper. Or maybe you think, I'm just a nobody. Leave it to the professionals, leave it to the evangelists. You know, that's their job. I, I, I'm nothing, I'm nobody. I, I, I'm no good at anything like that. I don't know what to say. Well, be encouraged because look at the disciples that are named who were on this fishing expedition. Verse 2 Simon Peter. Boy, did he let the Lord down. He was the one who was like, oh yeah, you know, I, I'd never let you down, Lord. And before the night's out, three times he denied that he knows it. Jesus deals with that actually later in this chapter. We'll come to that later. But Jesus uses him. He tells him he's got a job for him. And you might have let the Lord a big time, down a big time. None of us hasn't let him down at some time or other. But he still wants to you. You. It doesn't rule you out. Okay, he doesn't want you to keep letting him down or me to keep letting him down, but he still wants to use us. Or well, maybe like Thomas, who no, was doubting Thomas. The others told him Jesus was risen from the dead. They'd seen him, for, uh, unless I see uh, the prince in, the prince in his hands and thrust my uh, hand into his side where he'd been pierced with a spear, I'm not going to believe. And yet, he is using my to God. We believe he took the gospel to India. Uh, that's not in the scriptures, but from 
and that other and later accounts, he was used by the Lord. So don't think that you're all bad because of doubt. I mean, who else hasn't had doubts? And yeah, I have doubts from time to time. But you know what? With Peter, it was when he saw the Lord, and Jesus said, Okay, Thomas, put your fingers into the print of my hand, put your hand to my side, and he says, My Lord and my God. And when I've had doubts, one of the things I've often done is gone back to the evidence. Because often those doubts have been intellectual. So I said, Is it really true? And then go back to the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming that it is true. It is true. Not that it's just an intellectual belief, it's going to be a hard belief as well. But that's a great place to go sometimes, struggling with doubts, if that's the particular root of your doubts. Or maybe, yeah, you've got some sin that you struggle with, but join the club, don't we all? But here you've got the sons of Zebedee, whose nickname was the Sons of Thunder. They were got a pretty hot temper, James and John. And so, you know, that didn't rule them out. I'm not saying that's okay to carry on sinning. We, we don't want to do that. We want to be more like Jesus. But it doesn't rule you out of serving him. It doesn't rule you out. That's the great thing about it. He still wants to use you. Or maybe like these two unnamed disciples. We don't know who they were. And you think, I'm a nobody. Jesus still wants to be a And you are a simple in his eyes. You are fearful and wonderful. And you are precious to him. He shed his blood for you. And okay, maybe you're never going to get your name sort of uh, printed in the missionary magazines or whatever. It doesn't matter. Your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You'll get a reward in, in glory. And you may well be far ahead of some of us who, who do get our names sometimes in missionary magazines in terms of the queue, so to speak. But Jesus wants to you. He is so full of grace and compassion and love that he really wants to use all of us. And we've all got gifts, they are all important. They all need to be used for the church to function fully. But the idea isn't that we sort of get involved in church and then we sort of just think, yeah, well, you know, I'm just going to take, take it easy, I'm going to chill, I'm going to really just enjoy stuff and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm enjoying being a Christian. It's more than that because, as somebody said, the church is not a yachting club, but a fleet of fishing boats as we play our part in the Great Commission. But here's the disciples, they're going to come to this barbecue, and they've got this fish they've been trying to catch, and they've got a problem, they've been struggling to catch them. They've fished all night and caught nothing. So, how are we going to catch people? How are we going to bring people to the Lord? Well, if we're talking about bringing fish, here's a guy you want to uh, look up to. Anyone know who that is by any chance? It's Mike the Fisherman. And I, look at the size of that. Well, was that the one that got away, by the way, Mike? <laughs> so, Mike, tell me, have you ever fished all night? No. All day? And have you ever caught nothing? Ah. Well, well I, I can point you to someone who has a 100% success rate in fishing. So you can go to this person for advice. Get it from the expert. There she is. Because every time since we've been married that Lindsay's been fishing, she's caught something. Both times. <laughs> Meeting the first time was a salmon at a fish farm. And uh, we went to this fish farm and, uh, you know, you, you had to pay for what you caught. Within five minutes we both caught a salmon. We thought we were going to have a great fun for an hour fishing. We had to give up after five minutes because it was going to cost us too much. Um, and then on this occasion, she's got a cod. It took her, what, a couple of minutes to catch? Five minutes at most? So she's tuned <laughs> down. There you go. The expert. So Mike, you know, you can have a word with her after. But if too many people have beaten you to it, you can always ask this expert who's also got a 100% success rate of fishing since being married. Uh, with that salmon, uh, this was a pollock on the same fishing trip as Lindsay there. I think it took me a couple of minutes more than her to catch it. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, if you start talking to us, you'll find we're not the experts. Whereas, 
in the case of the disciples, they were. And you can imagine them. Here's the, they, they, they think this is a stranger on the beach. <laughs> he says, have you caught any fish? No. And then he says, okay, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. Now, you could forgive them, couldn't you really, if they'd said, sorry mate, but we don't know you. Never seen you around these, these uh, waters before. What do you know about fishing on the Sea of Galilee? We've been doing this all our lives. Uh, you know, you don't even look like a fisherman. So you could have excused them if they'd said that sort of thing, couldn't you? Until they, of course, they realised who it really was. But he was the true expert. And he said, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. They had the sense to obey, to follow that, and they caught those fish. Not what you'd expect. Previous time he told them to go out into deep water. Here they're in the shallows. They're only a hundred yards from shore. They've given up. They're on their way back. And by the way, when we're at that point to give up, then let's not miss the voice of Jesus telling us where to fish. Because maybe we've been fishing in the wrong place at the wrong time. So we need to listen to him. But going back to this, uh, we're on a, a fishing trip that's in a fjord in northern Iceland. I mean, well, I'm sorry, it wasn't a fishing trip, it was a whale watching trip. But they said, oh, for the last bit, we'll just take you over where near that island there and we'll do a bit of fishing. And uh, they gave us these uh, rods with these lures and said, just drop them in the water, you know, dangle around a bit. So we did. We didn't turn around and say, nah, nah, that ain't going to work, mate. You need to go over there. We reckon there's probably some fish there because they'd have rightly said to us, well, have you ever fished in these waters before? No. Nah. Do you do a lot of fishing? No. <laughs> so we listened to the experts and it worked out for the best. And that's what happened with the disciples. They listened to the expert, the one who is God over all creation. So either he sent the fish there or they were already there and he knew it, so he sent them there. But either way, he has provided that fish for them. But then they get back to shore. And he's got some fish he's cooking on this beach barbecue. Now, if I was one of the disciples, I'd be saying, Jesus, where'd you get those fish from? We, we fished all night, didn't get any. Did you get them from our competitors up the, the, the shore there? D did you just sort of miraculously? I, I don't, I'd be wanting to know, but anyway, he's already got some fish from somewhere and he's cooking. He doesn't need their fish. But again, it's Jesus. He says, okay, you can play a part too. I don't need you for fishing. I can do it all myself as the Lord of all creation. But I want you to play a part. It's the same when it comes to saving people. He can do it on his own. He doesn't need us. But he graciously says, I'd love you to play a part in my mission. I'd love you to be involved. I'd love you to partner with me. Isn't that so lovely of the Lord? Isn't that so gracious of him? And so, they listen to what he says. And I don't know, they thought it was a stranger. But when he said that, I wonder if it rang bells. I said, Jesus, did something like this happen before? When, when he first called to speak to disciples? Was it something about the authority in his voice? But they do it. They don't question him. They say, no, no, you're no fisherman. No, they do it. And the result is pretty good. So we've got to listen to his voice. We mustn't miss it. Even if they think, oh, is that Jesus? Checking against his word. He speaks to us in different ways, but ultimately, it is not directly through the word checking against his word. I'm be sure it's his voice, but if it is, by all means, do what he says, because he knows best, because he does. So we need to fish when and where he tells us. The trouble is, there's a lot of churches fishing in the 1960s or 1970s. Um, some have moved on a little bit, maybe fishing in the sort of 90s or even the Nords, or in the 2020s. Different culture. We need to be aware of the right bait to use. It's the same gospel, I know, but we present it in different ways. Look at the way Paul did in different cultures, whether it was speaking to the intellectual Athenians in Acts 17, or whether it was speaking to Jews in the Jewish synagogues. So we do need to adapt in that sense, though it's the same core message that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, by his death on the cross alone. But other than that, we have to be aware of the culture. I may have told you this before, but I read in a book called Must Brethren Churches Die by Kevin Dyer about this Aboriginal group 
and they were living in this encampment on the bend of a river. But over the decades, the river eroded the bend away until the river went more straight and it left an oxbow lake. And that oxbow lake then dried up. And somebody said to these Aborigines, well, aren't you going to move back to where the river is? Easier for fishing, easier for washing, easier for drinking water. No, they said, we're waiting for the river to come back to us. And that's the trouble with a lot of churches. They're waiting for the river to come back. They're waiting for us to have that culture where people automatically go to church and automatically take an interest. But we need to move to where the river is. So, there's a bit of how I'm a catching, but then we have this, this meal, this conversation over the meal um, between Jesus and Peter. Meals are always a great time for conversation, well, usually. Um, it's always quite good fun, isn't it, when you wait for somebody to take a big mouthful and you ask them a question. <laughs> so, that can sometimes inhibit the conversation, but if we time things right, it's a great, because it's, it's social, it's relaxing. And here is this meal, they're having a conversation, it gets awkward. Jesus, I don't know if Peter got indigestion, but Jesus says to him, Simon, son of John, John, do you truly love me more than these? And I think he's referring there to Peter's own statement and attitude before he denied Jesus. Because he was suggesting that he loved Jesus more than the other disciples loved him. Because when Jesus said, you're going to forsake me and abandon me this night, he said, oh, they might, but I won't. In other words, I love you more than they do, Lord. And then it comes down to the crash, doesn't it? So Jesus, I think, there is exploring if he's still got that sort of superior attitude. But he doesn't, does he? He doesn't say, yes, Lord, you know I love you more than they do. Oh, no. He says... Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. <laughs> so what the end of it, Jesus asked him twice more. And he's getting a bit frustrated the third time, isn't he? Because this is really hurting. Because the Lord, you know I love you. But I find that interesting. I'm sure you've heard it said that Peter denied Jesus three times. That's why he asked him three times. And so it's a painful memory. The memory's probably already been there because the last time Peter was by a charcoal fire was the time he denied Jesus, and now there's a charcoal fire. So I wonder if when he saw that, he thought, yeah, I remember what happened. And then Jesus starts asking, he's like, oh no, did you have to ask the Lord? But he did, he did. And it's inter interesting. I, I know that some would say that you can read too much significance into the words that are used because the New Testament is translated from Greek, and there are two, well, there are more than two words for love in Greek that are translated love in our New Testament, but there are two used in this conversation. The Lord uses the Greek word agape on the first two occasions, which is a sort of love shown in action, a sacrificial love. It is really the highest love. But Peter, every time, responds with philia, which means a sort of affectionate love. Um, it's that sort of love. It's not that highest love. Now, I could be reading too much into this, but I think there's a significance. You see, Peter can't say, I love you sacrificially at the moment, because of what he did when he let Jesus down. He does go on to be believed to sacrifice his own life in the service of the Lord later. But at this point, he can't say that. In fact, it's interesting how Jesus addresses him. He calls him Simon. He doesn't call him Peter, which means rock. He doesn't use his nickname Rocky because he hardly proved to be a rock when he denied that he knew the Lord. So that may be uh, made Peter feel a little bit cool. Why is he calling him Peter? But, in his response, he says, yes, you know I've got affection for you, you know I love you, as, in that sense, a sort of brotherly love. And the third time, Jesus drops the standard, you can say, he says, okay, Peter, do you feel it? Do you love me on that level? He says, yes, yes. So, Jesus, again, he's, he's, 
He's going to ask these awkward questions. He's going to reinstate him, so to speak, in front of the other disciples. Because this, I judge, is a public conversation. It doesn't say Jesus led him off uh, to a little conflict away from the others. I think this is taking place in front of the others. Because it's in front of the others he made his great boasts. So this is painful. But it's necessary. And it shows that Jesus has reinstated him. And that's what he wants to do. If you feel like that, I'm disqualified. Oh, he wants to reinstate you, he wants to reuse you. But he's got to search deep to get there. But again, he doesn't need us. But he wants us. So he wants that restoration. He wants you more than we can ever understand in this life. But then, final question. Are you ready to nurture others? You see... Jesus has been performing this open heart surgery on Peter, really digging and in, cutting into his heart to put it right for reconciliation, to see if he really does. Well, he knows he does, but it's, it's really to see if Peter's going to declare that publicly. And by the way, it's important to declare the love for you publicly. And baptism in particular is a great way of doing that in the first instance. And maybe we need that open heart surgery. Jesus needs to ask those awkward questions. But it's not just so we can sit back and sing nice worship songs all you know, at home and just enjoy it all for ourselves. It's for the benefit of others, both inside and outside the church, because the Lord says to him, Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Who are his lambs? Who are his sheep? It's his people, those who love him, those who are part of his family. We're the flock of God. And we need to nurture and encourage and feed and help each other. That's the idea. Um, but maybe this morning you were tempted to bail out on the church. You think, yeah, there, there, there's somebody who said something that's, they shouldn't have done and, and sadly that happens. You know, I, I know I've done that before. I've my big mouth and put my foot in it. And Maybe something else has happened in the church. I think you are some so that I thought they were a, a good Christian and uh, you know, what they did or saw what they did. And, uh, don't bail out on church, then. Don't bail out. It's in the church of the bride of Christ. You know, if I've got a friend, I do have a few friends, by the way, <laughs> I've got a friend, and I say to them, Ah, oh, yeah, why don't you come round? They say, Oh, shall I bring my No, no, I don't be your wife. Just, just you, just you. No, 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 no. Forget her. They'd be most insulted and offended, wouldn't they? And when we decide we don't want anything to do with church, we're going to bail out on you. But to him, that's the bride of Christ. Imagine how it feels. And you might have heard the saying, if you find the perfect church, don't join it. Because you ruin it. <laughs> Because none of us are perfect, and we won't find the perfect church. It's like a family. And yeah, people mess up in families, don't they? But the message of Christ is all about your forgiveness. We need to forgive those who've hurt us. Yeah, it's good if they come and are apologetic and restore sort of repentance. We need to forgive them. And we need to remember the church is a work in progress. That work will not be finished until the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, let's cut each other some slack and forgive and accept church isn't going to be perfect. But let's play our part to try and make things as good as we can. Feeding and caring for and helping others, practically but especially here, it's the focus to spiritually. But, I just... I'd like to finish with a story which I told here back in 2008. I do keep in mind of what stories I tell where, so that I don't repeat them too frequently. You may remember it if you were around in 2008, but if you weren't, well, uh, you might have heard it elsewhere. And it came to pass that a group existed who called themselves fishermen. There were many fish in the waters all around, week after week, month after month, year after year, the fishermen met in meetings and talked about their call to fish, the abundance of fish, and how they might go about fishing. Year after year, they carefully defined what fishing means, defended fishing as an occupation, 
declared that fishing is always to be a primary task of fishermen. In fact, there should be a decade of fishing. And continually they searched for new and better methods of fishing. Further, they said, the fishing industry exists by fishing, as fire exists by burning. And they left slogans like, fishing is the task of every fisherman. And every fisherman is a fisher. And they sponsored costly nationwide and worldwide congresses to discuss fishing issues like the new fishing equipment, fish calls, and whether any new baits had been discovered. Well, many who felt the call to be fishermen responded, and they were commissioned and set to fish. But, like the fishermen back at home, they never fished. They engaged in all kinds of occupations, so they built power plants to pump water for fish, and tractors to plant new to plow new waterways, and they made all kinds of equipment to travel here and there to look at fish hatcheries. Some also said they wanted to be part of the fishing party, but they felt called to furnish fishing equipment. Others felt their job was to relate to the fish in a good way, so the fish would know the difference between good and bad fishermen. Well, others simply felt that letting the fish know they were nice, land-loving neighbours, and how loving and kind they were, would be enough. These fishermen built large, beautiful buildings that they called fishing headquarters. And the plea was that everyone should be a fisherman, and every fisherman should fish. There's just one thing they didn't do. They didn't fish. Well, after one stirring meeting on the necessity of fishing, one young man left the meeting and went fishing! And the next day he reported he caught two big fish. Well, he was honoured for his excellent catch and scheduled to visit all the big meetings and tell all the other fishermen about the experience. And so he left his fishing in order to do that. And he was also placed on the fisherman's general board as a person having considerable experience. Now it's true that many of the fishermen sacrificed and put up with all kinds of difficulties. Some lived near the water and bore the smell of dead fish every day, and they received the ridicule of some who made fun of their fishermen's clubs and the fact they claimed to be fishermen but never fished. And they wondered about those who felt it was of little use to attend the weekly meetings and talk about fishing. After all, were they not following the master who said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. So, just have a look for a moment at those questions and see what the Lord's telling you. How do you answer those questions? Just let's pause and reflect on them. Father, thank you for reminding us of the power of our Lord Jesus, the Lord of all creation, the Lord over nature, sovereign in this fishing expedition we've just been reading and talking about. Lord, forgive us where we've let you down, where we've maybe even effectively denied you. Thank you that there's forgiveness, there's a way back. You want to restore, you want to use, just like you did with Peter. You're so kind and so gracious and so patient with us, Lord. Help us to respond by the way to that. And to love you, to really love you as we should, to love you more and more, to love you more sacrificially to do our part in going out to, to catch fish for you, so to speak, and to play our part in, in helping to nurture and build up those who come to know you, and pray that you will give great wisdom to the leaders here as they encourage these things and model these things in the church. We ask it in the name of that one who's called us to fish for people, our Lord Jesus. Amen.